Okay, good morning. Welcome again. Now, see, this is, uh, this is all through my routine off here. Me up here, intros and singing. I'm not built for that. You know, I got, I got one track mind here, but uh, welcome. Glad everybody's here. I guess you guys didn't know I'm also a, a worship leader. You know, I met, wear many hats around here. So, uh, but thank you for all coming. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Uh, you know, this morning I, I, I got, actually got breakfast in bed for Father's Day, you know, living large. So I'm going to try to make this like a, a daily thing. We'll see how that goes. Uh, probably not going to go very well. Uh, maybe you guys can put a word in the tree and say, you know, you should, you should do that for Pastor Tim. He's just a nice guy. You should bring him breakfast in bed. That, he deserves it. Maybe, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll take, maybe not. Uh, but probably not. Uh, but well, again, happy Father's Day, all the fathers are here. So uh, this morning we are in the book of Proverbs. We're just going to jump right into it because there's a lot going on in the book of Proverbs. The wisdom of God is in the book of Proverbs. Boy, there's a lot of stuff in the book of Proverbs, a lot of good stuff in the book of Proverbs. Uh, I don't know if many people spend much time in the book of Proverbs, but there is a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and so this morning we're just going to take an overview look at you know, what's happening in this book, how do we apply it to our lives in everyday living. And so uh, to kick it off as, as usual, we have the author. Well, the author, uh, King Solomon, is the, the principal writer uh, of Proverbs. He is instilling his wisdom because, he, as we know, he was the wisest person of all the land. God had given him a great deal uh, of wisdom. Uh, the date of the writing, you're looking at about 900 B.C. approximately. You're thinking about uh, when these were penned. And then, of course, like any book, well, why was this book written? What is the purpose? Well, it illustrates the importance of wisdom uh, and the style of life you need to pursue that kind of life. And so there's a lot of in input in here in regarding that. Here's a quick overview of how um, some people break these chapters down. Chapters 1 through 9, uh, principles from Solomon, uh, and he's talking to primarily the young, or especially his son, because he keeps saying, my son, my son, my son. Uh, 10 through 24, uh, Proverbs of Solomon, and so you see he compares the righteous and the wicked. Uh, 25 and 29, precepts by Solomon, and so Hezekiah and others put together some of the Proverbs that he wrote, and then 30 through 31, Proverbs by Agar and Lemuel. And so this kind of gives you a quick break down of how some of the chapters might be maybe um, overviewed or summarized, if that's helpful at all. At all. And so uh, it's hard to believe that we're already in the book of Proverbs, right? I mean, we started in Genesis, and now we're chugging along in the book of Proverbs. It's, it's pretty amazing that we're making that much progress, because we've been at this for, for a while now. And before you know it, We'll eventually be in the New Testament, and some of you will be like, ah, a little easier maybe, you know, because this Old Testament stuff, it can get pretty heavy at times, uh, all these crazy things. And so that's where we're at at this point in time. And so a couple things we need to see. Uh, as we've talked about in the past, uh, wisdom and knowledge are different. That's just the truth of it, right? So we live in a time where it's like the information age, right? We're getting tons of new information overloaded with information. Uh, and you might be very uh, smart and have a lot of knowledge, but that's different than wisdom. And so we have to realize that the knowledge uh, and information is different than wisdom. Because we see you can have a lot of knowledge about something, right? You can be very book smart but not be very wise. And we're going to see this laid out here um, pretty, pretty dramatically, you know, because in life you can have all kind of money and you can even be famous, but if you're not wise, it will destroy you, right? We see this all the time. People who have tons of fame and tons of money, but they don't have wisdom and that very thing destroys them. Uh, and so you have to see there is a difference between knowledge and information and wisdom in here. And so uh, this book of Proverbs is considered one of the poetic books uh, in the way of the writing is. There's uh, a few different poetic books in the Bible that are classify that as the type of literature. This will be one of them. And the Proverbs, essentially proverb is just a, a short saying or a, a nugget of truth. And it gets, gets a, part, uh, a, a deep principle. You know, we have different things like this in our culture. People have different quick sayings, um, even like look before you leap or something like that. You know, there's different sayings people have. Uh, but here in the, in the Proverbs, these are quick little things. Now, understand, this is not just good advice, but this is godly advice. This is, these are foundational principles rooted in God. And we're going to see that in, in, in a second here. Uh, and essentially, here's the thing. 
this is very practical stuff, you know, like if you're one of those people who are like, all right, I just need the nuts and bolts, some stuff here. Um, this is basic practical stuff for living godly lives. Uh, this essentially is uh, how do you take your relationship with God and live it out in the public world, right? That's what it's talking about. How do you take your own personal relationship with God and then how does that translate and you taking it out of these doors and living life? And that's essentially what it talks about. And there's many, many principles that we're going to see covered in here. And so check this out. Let's just kick it off here. Proverbs 1, 1 through 6. Check this out. It says this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. And so what we see is actually the, uh, the root word for wise or wisdom actually means to be skilled at something or to be an expert at something. And so in this context, it's what does it mean to be uh, skilled or expert in uh, living well? Uh, what does it mean to be uh, a skilled or expert in living a well, good life? And so we're going to see some of these things in, in a second. Now, here's a thing. The book of Proverbs covers a lot of topics. You know, there's a lot, a lot of different topics in there for living wise lives, living godly lives. Today, we're just going to talk about five five main topics that we see covered here in the book of, of Proverbs. Uh, and so the first topic is this, is uh, the mind. Um, number one is the mind. And this essentially is your worldview. This is what you, what's going on in between your ears. This is how you view reality. Uh, everyone has this view about um, reality. And everyone has this. So the question is, what goes on in your mind? Because what goes on in your mind will greatly impact what goes on in other areas of your life. Because guess what? A lot of things start in the mind, you know? Whether it's anger or hate or, or self-doubt or, or whatever it might be. But nevertheless, this principle covers what, where is your starting point? Where is your starting foundation? I go to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, in Scripture, wisdom, knowledge, it all starts with God. You know, the, these things are, are foundational principles that were established by God. Uh, these are things that you're going to live by and go by. Actually, the Bible in different places says, The fool in his heart says there is no God. And so, for the Christian, we're starting already with, okay, God is the one who is the creator. God is the one who has decided what is right and what is wrong and has set the parameters. And therefore, that's going to inform uh, how my life is. It's going to inform what the purpose of life is. And that then is going to inform how I make decisions. And so, realize this, that this is the key principle. That it says the beginning of knowledge and wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now, the word fear of the Lord, it's not about like, oh, I'm trembling and shaking that, that God is going to like strike me with a lightning bolt or is just ready to pounce on me anytime I mess up. That's really not what it's talking about. We often think that, that we're all just going to be curled in a ball, terrified of God, and we better not mess up or he's going to slap us across the head. And no, what this is meaning, the word means like a, a high respect, a high reverence for, an awe that, uh, that who, who God is. And, and uh, it's the same word in Leviticus that they use when it says parents uh, or, or children to, uh, to, to fear or to, to respect, rather, highly respect and honor your parents. It's the same word used. And so what this means is that if you're going to be living a wise life, it starts with a high reverence and respect for God. Uh, and, and that's going to begin the path to knowledge. Because again, different places we see in, the, in Scripture, it says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Uh, and so for the Christian, this is the beginning. If you don't have God, you don't have anything. You know? And so realize this is where the whole principle of things, of things start. Because again, everybody is 
quote unquote religious. You know, it's a very popular saying to say, you know, I'm not religious, but really it is. Because what is religion? Religion is a worldview about reality and answers the fundamental questions of origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Origin, where do I come from? Meaning, what is the purpose of life? Morality, how do I determine what is right and wrong? Um, and destiny, what happens when a person dies? Answer those questions. Everybody has a view on those topics, and so that functions the exact same way as religion. But the core thing is, what is informing your worldview? If it's not God, then what is it? What is it? If God is not your source, your foundation you go to, then what is it? And then whatever your answer is, well, that is your God. It's that simple, right? Um, and so let's just keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. It begins with the mind. Also, we see in the book of Proverbs, there's a lot of warnings about being proud and arrogant, a lot of warnings about not accepting instruction. Um, the, the, book off, the book mentions uh, mockers and fools and sluggards and all these different types of people. Uh, but the thing is, if you're sitting here and you're a Christian or whatever, uh, or if you're listening to this and, and you're just like, oh, I don't need that, or I've heard this before, or, you know, I, what, nah, whatever, um, it's saying be careful because it's foolish. The wise person, it says, accepts instruction. The wise person listens attentively. The wise person is, actually embraces correction. It is a fool that doesn't want to ha- hear it. It's a fool that thinks they've got it all figured out. And, and so keep that in mind as we go forward. Because really, that's part of your mindset too. If you're proud, if you don't want to hear it, if you think, I've heard it before, I don't need, I can't learn anything. If you think, I've already arrived, you would be classified in the Bible as a fool. Uh, and so keep that in mind as we move forward. So we got the mind covered. Okay, what is my, the, the wisdom and knowledge begins with the foundation of the Lord, a fear of the Lord, a high respect, reverence for the Lord. Uh, and again, that's informing your worldview. But again, everyone has something that's informing your worldview. Second thing is this, is okay, um, we go from the mind, but now what about the mouth? <laughs> the mouth is a big, big topic in the book of Proverbs, right? Uh, because let's be honest. Your mouth can get you in trouble. Anyone ever get your mouth in trouble before? Huh? Anyone ever ha- open your mouth and it got you in total trouble? Well, if you're married, then for sure. You know, I'm sure that's happened, absolutely, because uh, this is one of those things that is almost a guarantee uh, that you got to keep a tight rein on your mouth. There's, there's a difference between a godly mouth and an ungodly mouth. Uh, and in the book of Proverbs, I believe it mentions it some 150 times or more uh, regarding the mouth or the tongue or controlling how you control your mouth. Uh, but that's the reality. If you are a godly person, then you will be able to control your mouth. Uh, now, does that mean you don't mess up? Pfft, well, no. I mean, let's be real. We're human. We're sinful. We all fall in short. But it does mean you should be at least trying uh, to control and, and you should have a control over it. You can't just spout off in any which way or say whatever you want. So, for example, uh, go to the book of Proverbs while we're there. Uh, Proverbs 6, uh, 16 through 19 says this. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Now, when you see something that there are these things that God hates, your, your ears should appear a couple of them. Well, what, what, is, what, is, what does God hate? What's interesting is three of those things have to do with your mouth. Three of those things have to do with words. Uh, and so anytime we see that, that should kind of cause us to, okay, wait a second. This is a big deal to God. This isn't something that is just a, a small, small detail. And then there's a lot of things, especially in the book of Proverbs, about guarding your mouth. So, for example, we'll go to Proverbs 11, verse 12 says this, Whoever derides their neighbor has no sense, but the one who has understanding holds their tongue. And go to Proverbs 10, 19, Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. And 29 through 20 says, Do you see someone who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for them. And so you see a principle, key principle, basic principle, is you got to learn to shut your trap sometimes. You know, that's just, you know, that's the, that's the Tim Kutch translation. Shut your pie hole. Uh, and so hold your tongue. Don't always be running off at your mouth. They're, the wise person holds the tongue. Uh, the foolish person is always quick to spout off, always quick to, to tell somebody off. It's not wise. And guess what? Um, 
God telling you to hold your tongue and me to hold my tongue, it's actually for our benefit. So, for example, go to Proverbs 13, 3 says, Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. It'll keep you out of trouble. You know, I know there have been times <laughs> where I've said something, and like, oh, it's just going to get me more trouble. You know, I'm sure people here have been, um, many times, a train that has been to my wife. I, uh, I shouldn't have said that. It's just, it's just, it's just making things worse. Uh, and so the wise person holds a tongue, knows, you know what, I, I be slow to speak. Um, you know, honestly, uh, the rea sad reality is not holding your tongue can cost you your life even in this day and age. You know, I, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, Remember back in this is oh, this was years and years ago. Basically, it was somebody I had fam well, someone I knew um, uh, and or knew of rather, uh, and family knew him. But nevertheless, uh, essentially, what happened is the person was killed because they were they told somebody off. The person went to the car, got a gun, and killed him. It was that simple, you know. He went. He just I'm going to tell this person off. Flipped him off. Flipped uh, flipped out. Told him off, and then it cost him his life. You know, and the sad thing is, you don't know what people are doing nowadays. You're, you have road rage and you want to tell somebody off. Well, you see plenty of examples of people then going and killing people because of that. Uh, and so the sad thing is, that's the world we live in. But if you keep a hold of your tongue, it will actually keep you out of calamity. Uh, you're doing yourself a favor. It's to your benefit that you hold, you hold your tongue. Also, uh, here's another thing that the, that the proverb says is not only holding your tongue, but the manner in which you speak is also important. So, for example, go to Proverbs 15, 1 says this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, again, we'll just, we'll, we'll just, we'll just stay in the marriage, marriage uh, avenue here. But if you answer someone like, yeah, what do you want? You know, like, oh, I'm, I'm, what, 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 what is it? Versus, yeah, honey. <laughs> you see the difference there? Uh, there's a world of difference on what kind of reaction that's going to get. And the sad thing is, truthfully, often the longer you're married, or we often do this to people that we're close with, is we're very short with our loved ones. You know, oh, what? Um, yeah, yeah, we act all put out. We act all, you know. But yet a phone rings. Hey, how are you? You know, hey, yeah, I'm doing great. And then your spouse in the background, what do you want? I'm on the phone. You know, yeah, everything's are great, good. You know, that's the truth. How we speak, the manner in we speak is really important. And I think for sure, as Christians, we need to do a better job of, of speaking kindly, you know, instead of having harsh. You know, that's one thing we should even do better in marriages and relationships and family is being more mindful of how we're coming across and speaking. You know, if you're short with somebody, you're snap at somebody, uh, it's not good. It, it, it's actually foolish. It's not, a foolish. it's not a wise thing to do that. And so keep that in mind. Also, not only that, so time to hold the tongue, not say anything. A time also be careful of how you're saying the word you're saying, because tone is a big deal. But the timing is important as well. When you say things, go to Proverbs 25, says this, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on a wound, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. So when someone's going through a hard, rough time, why are you there being all cheerful and, and, and saying things, even though maybe if it's, it's a good intent, you're actually just pouring vinegar on the wound. And so timing is key. We've talked about this actually in the book of Job. We've talked about this in different periods of, of, of sermons is, you know what? You got to be mindful that there's sometimes a right time and a wrong time to say something, you know, and be careful of that. Uh, you got to be mindful. You know what? Now isn't the time for me to bring this up. Um, if you're in public, now is the time to bring up this thing to shame this person or, or to embarrass them. Or if someone's going through a hard time, now is the time for me to try to get all theological and explain things. I'm just going to care for them and love them. Uh, and so, or, or uh, your spouse comes from a hard, home from a hard day at work. You know what? They had a hard day. Now probably is the time for me to tell them that, um, fill in the blank, whatever, whatever it is going to escalate their mood. Uh, and so timing is, is key in terms of what you say. Guess what? Words can and do affect 
emotions and relationships. They really do. So go to Proverbs 12, 18. It says this, The words of the reckless pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, words can do a lot of damage. How, how many relationships have been destroyed by words? Uh, how many wounds people have been carrying around, sometimes for years, because of words? You know, someone said something to you or about you. Um, and, and, or maybe you grew up and, and you had a family or parents that were always telling you, you're no good, you're bad, you're stupid. You know, or people in school teasing you for things. And whether you realize it or not, you internalize that. And that can really do a lot of damage for people. Um, words can hurt. Uh, words do hurt. And words can wound and cut very deeply. And so it says, the tongue of the wise brings healing. Uh, you know, that's why, again, in Proverbs, there's a lot of talking about not gossiping. If you're talking about other people, putting them down, passing around rumors, you're not to do that. Um, God says that is foolish, that is ungodly to do that. Be very, very careful in how you're talking about other people when tearing them down. Uh, it's not a godly thing to do. It's not a wise thing to do. And again, it destroys relationships. You know, again, gossip happens, rumors happen, and, and someone told you someone did this or that, and maybe true or maybe not true, and now that changed how you view them. Now, you, next time you see them, that changes how you treat them. And it's just a bad, bad thing to engage in. That's why the word says, do not engage in gossip. It is foolish. It is ungodly. And I know sometimes what happens is we want to, to gossip, but we'll make it like it's actually godly. So, hey, guess what? They did this. Um, let's, let's pray for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so let's be careful we don't justify gossip by um, religious, religiousizing it, if you will, um, making it out there, oh, we're actually going to pray for them or, or whatever. Be careful with that. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, and then on a positive note, uh, use words to encourage and lift up. As Christians, we used to be speaking life to people and encouragement. So go to Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And 12, 25 says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers up. And then lastly, under the section, go to Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love its fruit or love it will eat its fruit. And so your mouth, your words have a great profound impact. They can tear somebody down or they can lift them up. You know, you can encourage them or you can belittle them and make them feel terrible and, and try to hurt them and wound them. Uh, and so be very careful. One thing is clear in the book of Proverbs and all throughout the Bible. Christians, people who are, are godly people, control their mouths and they don't tear people down. They don't belittle them. They don't try to hurt them and wound them. Rather, they encourage them. They lift them up. There is great power in what you can say. And so be very careful. And there's different things in the Bible, too. It talks about wholesome talk versus unwholesome talk. You know, if you're around your buddies or your friends and you're telling um, uh, certain jokes that you know you wouldn't otherwise say in church or around someone, you know, just use some discretion here. There are things that we need to be careful about and how we say, right? The words we say, how we say them, when we say them, what is appropriate and un inappropriate. Um, because again, it's all about what? What does honor, what is, what is honor God? What does honor others? What does uh, reflect God's love and mercy and grace? And, and, and what does uh, esteem people who is created in his image? But keep that in mind as, as we move forward. Thirdly is this. All right, we're off the mouth. We got the mind, we got the mouth, and now we're going to go to drive. This is, okay, um, are you a driven person? This essentially is comparing the uh, diligent person versus the lazy person. And it has a lot to say about people that are lazy, people that are sluggards. That's kind of an odd name, right? You sluggard. Uh, but there's a lot in here. We won't spend too much time on it because it's pretty straightforward. But this is the hardworking person versus the lazy person. So go to Proverbs 6, 6 through 11 says this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food in harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, 
A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to get rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. In 1423, he says this, All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And so the real question, simple question is, you know, what kind of worker are you going to be? Uh, are you going to be a, a, a lazy worker or someone just kind of, you know, nah, not, not for me? Or are you going to be a diligent worker? You know, and the thing is this, compare a lazy person and compare it to a person that is really skilled and great at something. And you see the difference, the time they put in, you know. Uh, you, you can name any, like Michael Jordan. Uh, if you ever watched any of his documentaries, like the time he spent playing basketball and practicing and living and breathing, uh, becoming one of the, in my opinion, the greatest basketball ever player. Sorry, LeBron James. You know, he's better than LeBron James. That's just, you know, well, that's a fact. So, anyways, but Michael Jordan, the, the greatest basketball player, you know, in my opinion, but definitely better than LeBron James. Uh, it is time he spent playing and, 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 and honing his craft and visualizing and working the work ethic. It's just it's the difference between someone who's casual about it, you know. I saw an article this week about the new Steelers running back, Najee Harris. They had to send him home from practice because he was working too much or too hard. They said, listen, you got, you got to leave here. You're, you're here too much. you got to take a break and a rest. You see there's a difference between someone who is driven and motivated versus someone who is lazy or someone who is just casual about it. And the question, what kind of worker are you going to be? Are you, you you're going to get up and say, okay, I'm going to be motivated. I'm going to get some stuff done. A couple weeks ago, TCB, right? Taking care of business. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. And blessings will come from that, you know? And uh, it, it, it's, it can be challenging sometimes. We can, all, we can all fall into ruts. I get that. Uh, for me, what has helped me is actually I, I, I on, on my phone and, and list, um, well, was a year or so ago, actually, I did a whole long thing of goals and things I wanted to do and accomplish and achieve in every area of my life, you know, whether it's here at the church, things we want to do, um, things that just around the house I need to do, uh, things in other areas. So you make a list, you make some goals, and then you move towards those of what you need to do. And then even now, weekly, I have a list of goals and things to do that I love checking them off my checklist. Um, but what I found is, though, boy, sometimes you get way less done than you want because so many other things pop up you have to do. But nevertheless, you want to have a goal. You want to have a drive. You want to have a motivation. You want to, to honor God. And I think it comes down to this is you, you go in a place in Scripture and it says, you know, in all things that you do, do it for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And you can, you can do that in your job. You can work and glorify God by, be, by being a hard worker, by, by me being motivated, by, by wanting to have some, some goals and aspiration and, and hone your craft or, or, or get something accomplished and done. Uh, and that's the key. Now, I, I know it's, it, you see... Uh, the, the common perception nowadays is people don't want to work, right? That's, that's, you see this on the news, you see articles and things like that. People don't want to work. People want handouts. People, people think they're entitled to, to whatever. Um, nevertheless, different topic, different sermon, but a key principle is this. For a godly person, for a wise person, you want to be a hard worker. You want to be motivated. You want to be driven. Um, now, you don't want to... to you need some rest, put it that way, because there's an importance for a Sabbath, you know, Sabbath day rest, and you want to make sure that you're not just uh, working your life away, uh, but this is the key principle for a godly person is what kind of worker are you going to, to be? Fourth a topic in the book of Proverbs we're going to talk about today is relationships. Um, there's a lot to say in the Bible, but especially Proverbs, about how a wise person engages in relationships and how an unwise person engages in relationships. Uh, the first type of relationship we'll cover really quickly is friendship, right? Friends. Um, what kind of friends do you have? Uh, here's the thing. We are hardwired to be in a relationship. God has, God has designed us to be in a relationship with people, not to be isolated. You know, there's a reason why in prison solitary confinement is a punishment. You know, as humans, we need interaction. We need relationship. And friends are very key. Um, so go to Proverbs 27, 17. says this, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpen, sharpens another. 18, 24 says this, 
One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And so good friends are for our benefit, right? We we sharpen one another. We can encourage one another. We can uplift one another. We can help one another. We can um, be there for one another. Uh, And so there's a lot of good benefits to good, sound friendship. Uh, And so really, it is a benefit to have a good friendship. It is a benefit to have those relationships. Uh, We were designed for that. Uh, And but here's the thing: you got to be careful about what kind of friends you're surrounding yourself with. Um, there's foolish and there's um, wise. So go to Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. And 13, 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. And so choose wisely who your friends are. You know, Now, that's not, again, that's, that's not saying we are, we're some like, religious people like nose up in the air well I cannot be friends with you you sinner like that's that's foolish no that's not what it's talking about again look who Jesus hung out with and walked with and ministered to and cared and loved for it was the quote unquote sinners of society but what this is saying is the people who are like your closest go-tos the people that are like your besties you know be very careful and be alert is their lifestyle or habits dragging you away from God, um, whether it's speech or uh, whether it's um, you know, activities or whatever. Now, again, you have to use some discretion here because certainly you can still you know, um, be friends with people who you know, maybe do things you don't approve of, but you have to be careful of, well, is it dragging me down? Time and time again, I see people whose friends drag them into places Um, in life that destroy them. And the reality is, the truth is, uh, I know people who've hung out with the wrong crowd and it's cost them their life, you know, whether through addictions and things like that. That's a sad reality. Uh, And you have to be uh, careful and alert on who you hang out with. And sometimes if it's um, really harming your walk with God or harming your physical life or even in terms of addictions and things like that, you need to get away. You need to distance yourself from certain people if it gets to that point, uh, because it is foolish to be around the people that are tearing you down like that and that will lead you away from God. Next kind of relationship that we can see is spouse. Um, spouse is, is, is a kind of relationship um, that, okay, there's a wise way of, of dealing with each other, and, and, and really what it comes down to is living a, a life to Honor God and to honor one another, right? Uh, is our marriage going to honor God and honor each other? Now, I, I get it. Relationships and marriages can be tricky and challenging, especially if the person is not maybe in the same place where you are in terms of your spiritual walk or whatever. Um, I just say do the best you can, but there's still some principles in here we can see um, that we can go by. Uh, now, I will preface all this with, remember, Uh, He's writing primarily to young men, uh, or especially his son. He keeps saying, my son, my son, my son. So a lot of things is going to be about the wife, but um, they certainly can apply to a husband as well in terms of godly living. So I just say that because uh, we don't want the women to think we're picking on them, because we're not. It's just, you know, this is is why, who who he's writing to. So let's kick it off. We'll go to Proverbs 12, 4. A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. And in Proverbs 31, we'll do 10 through 12, and 25 to 31 says this, A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her work bring her praise at the city gate. And so, again, you can apply a lot of these principles to to, uh, husband and wife, but um, 
You know, are you bringing good, not, not bad? Are you, are you um, fearing the Lord? I think really the chief principle is this. I, I think it, it, verse, verse 30, charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. A man to be husband that fears the Lord is to be praised. The question is, we have to ask ourselves, is our, is our marriage honoring God? If not, what can we do to, to, to better do that? Um, and then is, my, is our marriage honoring each other? You know, do we lift each other up or are we always tearing each other down and criticizing and belittling and, and all that kind of stuff? Um, you know, the, the real thing is this, is, I think, is it begins with a fear of the Lord, right? Having a, having a reverence, a love, a respect, a gratitude for God and then that then says, you know what, I want to live a life in my marriage and all my relationships that honors him and honors the other person. And that's what it comes down to. But, you know, I get it. It can be hard and challenging. But if together you both, quote unquote, fear the Lord, and respect and, and love and, and work together, um, that's, that's where it begins with. Now, I get, I get sometimes it's cha- challenging. There's, life's hard and there's different things. But that should be the aim goal is does, I want to honor God in how I do marriage and how I treat my spouse. I want to honor my spouse and how I treat them, how I talk to them, uplift them, not tear them down. Uh, and then you know what? Here, it, the proverb says there's a lot of key components to this. And, you know, a key component, um, one basic thing that we can all do is act in a more godly manner toward your spouse. That's, that's you know... Um, don't mistreat them. Don't treat them poorly. Don't try to tear them down. Uh, and, and sometimes, especially over time, um, you, you see this kind of happening. Uh, and the proverb says, listen, it's not wise to do that. So again, we'll go to proverb, but uh, he's, a lot of it is uh, he's speaking to the young men, so he's talking about the wife. But again, men, this applies to you as well. And so go to Proverbs 27, 15 through 16. A quarrelsome wife is like a dripping of a leaky roof in the rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. Or go to Proverbs 21, 19. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. 14, 1. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. And I ought to say, men, women, husbands, wives, don't be quarrelsome. Don't be ill-tempered and build up your house. Don't tear your own house down by the way in which you treat others, uh, each other, essentially. Uh, it's, it's one, one way is wise, one way is unwise. You know, One way is wisdom, one way is foolishness. And so this is basic stuff. You know, this, this is one way you can honor God and honor others is, is by not being quarrelsome, um, by, by not tearing each other down, by not being ill-tempered. Husbands and wives, it, it both applies uh, for sure. Uh, it, it, is, it is wise and godly to uplift. It is foolish and ungodly to tear down. And when you do that, you're not honoring God uh, and you're not honoring each other. And it's a wicked thing to do, actually. And so we need to be careful that we don't do that. And now I get it. We're all, again, we're all sinful. We're all imperfect. Sometimes that may happen. But you don't want this to become your normal default position and actions. Uh, and so if that's where you've gotten to, today is a good day to refresh, reboot, and, and restart. Because it's never too late to, to do that. Um, next relationship real quickly is children. There's a wise way to engage in a relationship with children, with your own children. So uh, go to Proverbs 22, 6, uh, says this, uh, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Uh, and so a couple things. Uh, number one, if you have children, uh, training them when they're young. And that's often by example. You know, how Your children are going to do more what you do than what you tell them to do. You know, we often want to you know, do as I say, not as I do. The truth is, they're going to most likely repeat what they see happening in the home, what they see you talking like, or what they see you doing, or the way they, you, that they see you living. Uh, not how, what you say, but what you do. And so training them in the way of, of to respect and honor and live a life that honors God, by example, is a key foundational thing. 
Uh, that, that is principle number one. And then also you'll see in the book of Proverbs, it says time and time again that discipline is needed. You know, discipline your children. It says do not withhold discipline them from them because it is not loving to do that. Uh, children need discipline. Uh, make sure that you are, 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 are doing that and not later regret that you didn't do that. Uh, but keep that in mind. All right, and lastly, here we go. We're almost there. Fifth principle uh, is disposition. Uh, this is like, what kind of disposition do you have, right? There is a wise well, disposition. There is a foolish disposition. There is a godly disposition. There is an ungodly disposition. And now, we'll just cover these really quickly because there's a lot of different things that it says in terms of this. But um, first thing is this. All right, if you're going to be a godly, wise person, you got to be even-tempered. you got to control your temper. We've already seen this a little bit, but go to Proverbs 14, uh, 16 through 17. A quick-tempered person does foolish things. Go to 29, 11. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Can you control your temper? Are you controlling your temper? Um, and if you really struggle with this, maybe you need to talk to somebody. Nothing wrong with that, you know? I, I, there's no shame in needing to talk to somebody about something you're struggling with, whatever it might be. Um, so please, you know, you can always call me for anything you need, or a counselor, or, or another pastor, like whatever, um, or a good friend, whatever. Uh, but it, you got to be even tempered. You know, I know a lot of people struggle with temper issues. You know, uh, and so you got to be even tempered. It's not wise to lose your temper. Um, that's in terms of even, even when you're online and posting things on Facebook. You might want to take a second and say, you know what, mm, maybe I don't want to post this. I shouldn't post this. What benefit is it going to bring? But, but nevertheless. Uh, next thing we see for a, a wise person or a godly person, you're non-combative. You're, you're not looking to start a fight. You're not looking to nitpick. You're not looking to quarrel. Um, fools are trying to do that. So there's a lot here. We'll go and read through them because I think it's, it needs hammered home for a lot of us. Proverbs twenty two sixteen, fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Nineteen eleven, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. You know what? Someone wrongs you. Someone says something. <laughs> overlook it. Don't always be just quick to jump in and, and tell somebody off and start a fight. Like sometimes, it, oftentimes, it is much more wise just to overlook something. If you're always trying to look for how somebody wronged you, if you're always looking for how someone's out to get you or did you wrong, you're going to live a pretty miserable life. And you're just gonna, it's always going to be quarrel and strife. Stop doing that. Don't do that. It's not wise to do that. Go to 15, 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. 17, 14. Starting a quarrel was like breaching a dam, so stop or so drop the matter before the dispute breaks out. 20 verse 3. It is to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. 30, 33. For as churning cream produces butter, and as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. 27, 3. Stone is heavy and sand a burden, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. All I have to say is, don't be quarrelsome, don't pick fights, don't, don't try to nitpick, uh, don't try to stir up strife and anger that is foolish, ungodly. Be wise, be smart, be a peacemaker. You know, we should have these verses listed at the next business meeting. That would be a wise thing, huh? Yeah, we'll see how people follow that. Uh, some people, that's not their end game. They love to get things rolling. Uh, yeah. Different topic. Uh, so don't be unwise. Be smart in how you handle things, how you do things. Uh, if you're trying to nitpick and quarrel and, and look at how everyone wronged you and stir up stuff, you are a fool, the Bible says. Not me. I'm saying it too, but the Bible says it. So keep that in mind as we go through. Uh, next, it's uh, non-vengeful. If you're wise, you're non-vengeful. You're not trying to get somebody back. So Proverbs 20, 22. Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord, and he will avenge you. In 24, 29, do not say, I'll do them as they have done to me. I'll pay them back for what they did. 
nope, it's not wise, not godly, don't do it. Also, uh, a wise and godly person is kind and generous. So go to Proverbs 11, 16 through 17. A kind-hearted woman gains honor, but ruthless men gain only wealth. Those who are kind benefit themselves, but the cruel bring ruin on themselves. 11.25, a generous man will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Uh, 14.31, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy, honor God. So are, are you helping the poor and the needy? Are you refreshing others? I love that, that other verse. You know, a generous person will prosper. Or, uh, prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. That's a, I love that. Do you refresh others? Or do you just anger others and tear them down and fight with others and nitpick and quarrel and gossip? And that's a big difference, you know. You know people that you're around, that you're you're around them, and man, you just feel like refreshed and good. And there are other people that you walk away from, and you're just like, ah, I gotta get this off of me. It's just like the anger and the venom and the toxicity. It's like, you know, there's a difference. And one is wise, one is unwise. One is godly, one is ungodly. Um, and then we'll, we'll close with this, two verses. Go to Proverbs 17. Uh, it says this, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Wow, what is on the inside of you? How do you get that joy, that cheerful heart? Obviously, it's rooted in God. But as Christians, walk around in a certain manner that, that we're called to be. And then lastly, Proverbs 27, 19 as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. You know what? You can say all the things you want to say. Your life is going to really speak the truth of, of what your heart is like and what kind of person you are, um, whether you truly fear and honor and, and walk with the Lord or whether you don't, um, whether you are wise or whether you are a fool. Uh, you know, because words are just words. But this says, you know what? Your life will reflect your heart. Um, how you treat others, how you walk with God or don't, uh, that will truly reflect where your heart is and whether or not you really do um, have a relationship with God. Now, as we close, I just say, I encourage you to spend time in the book of Proverbs. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, but the thing is, you have to apply these things to your life. You really do. Because guess what? Solomon was the wisest man alive. God gave him more wisdom than anybody else. But yet, guess what? He departed from it. Can you imagine if Solomon would have followed this advice all of his life? Especially the one with relationships, because he had some relationship troubles with women. You know? um, uh, can you imagine the difference? Just hearing this does very little unless you apply it to your life. You have to apply these principles to your life and live wise lives, right? Um, that's where he went wrong. He didn't take his own advice. And so you have to apply these principles, actually live them out in your life. I mean, I think the life of Solomon should be a warning. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. You know? And we're not perfect. None of us we get that. Uh, and here's the thing, too. All of this is... It's not just behavior modification, but rather this is what it means to live a wise life and to live a life that glorifies and honors God. Because that's what we're called to do, right? To live lives that glorify and honor Him and advance His kingdom. And one of the ways is actually living wise lives versus foolish lives. And guess what? This stuff is for your benefit. That when you do this stuff, when you actually walk with a high reverence and respect for the Lord and it affects how you live your life, you will be blessed, and you will avoid a lot of calamity if you, by otherwise violating those principles. It's just common sense uh, if you can do that. So my encouragement this morning is spend time in Proverbs. Read a proverb a day or two or whatever. And how can we apply these to our lives and relationships? Let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every single person here. God, we ask that you help us to be wise. Help us to live wise lives. Help us to live godly lives, Father. Help us to have you permeate every area of our lives, from our mind to our mouth, to our relationship, to our dispositions, to our work life. Help you be and engulf every area, God, where we're walking with you, living not unwise, but wise. 
And when we do that, we'll see the blessings and fruit for, that comes from that. It's for our benefit. And when we do that, God, it glorifies and honors you. And God, we're here, and again, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done through your son, Jesus Christ. That the core of the gospel is that you sent your son, Christ, to die on the cross. He was raised again. And because of that, we can have eternal life with you. Help us to accept that and walk with you. And anyone here that's never made a commitment, they can pray that, that you save them. They can repent of their sins and a self-centered way of living and turn towards a God-centered way of living. They can trust in you for their salvation, for their life, and walk with you. And for us, all those who have done that, we also need to make sure that we're walking in wise ways that actually our heart, our lives, are reflecting you and your love. God, guide us and lead us. We pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.